Hello, welcome to lecture 61 of this series. This series of lectures is based on my book manual, Fluid, Electrolyte, and Acid-Based Disorders, A Pathophysiologic Approach to Common and Clinical Problems. I am Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I am a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find the book on Amazon at the link below. We are still on Chapter 8, Metabolic Acidosis. Today we are going to discuss distal or type 1 renal tubular acidosis. I've showed this slide before. The causes of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis can be renal or extra renal. Uh, when we're talking about renal causes, we can have advanced chronic kidney disease, stages 4 or 5, or we can have renal tubular acidosis. Renal tubular acidosis can be hypokalemic, as in proximal or type 2 RPA. We talked about that in the previous lecture, or it can be due to distal or type 1 RTA. Renal tubular acidosis can also be hyperkalemic, and this comes in two types, voltage-dependent, also called hyperkalemic distal RTA, or type 4 RTA, which is due to aldosterone deficiency or resistance. This is going to be the subject of the next lecture. What causes distal or type 1 RTA? The causes are either genetic or acquired. I have to say that there's another name for distal RTA, classical distal RTA. Now, genetic causes are due to mutations in the hydrogen ATPase or due to mutations in the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. Either way, you are going to have problems with acidity, with excretion of hydrogen. Now, some of these mutations are associated with deafness, some are not, some are autosomal recessive, some are autosomal dominant. These are very rare disorders. Now, in acquired distal RTA, which is more common, the patients can have either a problem with membrane permeability to hydrogen, meaning the hydrogen leaks back. So the, uh, the distal nephron will pump hydrogen out, but then it leaks back, okay? So this is due to a gradient defect, meaning the patient cannot maintain enough gradient to pump the hydrogen out and keep it out. And the classical example is amphotericin B. And another example is a defect in hydrogen ATPase. And this is a major problem because this is how hydrogen is pumped out. And the example here is Sjogren's syndrome. Actually, my uh, mentor, along with the other colleagues I had at the time at St. Louis University, published a case of patient, uh, of a patient, actually more than one patient, with Sjogren's syndrome and distal RTA, and they demonstrated complete absence of hydrogen ATPase, okay, the vacular hydrogen ATPase pump. Now, um, acquired distal RTA can be idiopathic, sometimes we don't know the cause, but many times there is a secondary cause, like I just said, Sjogren's syndrome, SLE, hypergammaglobulinemia, all those are autoimmune disorders, Drugs on top is amphotericin B, but we have others like lithium, phoscarnate, some toxins, mercury, toluene toxicity. And sometimes it's due to a tubular interstitial condition like some patients with kidney transplant and Balkan's nephropathy. What about the pathophysiology? We said that in distal RTA, there's a problem with hydrogen secretion. There's a decrease in ammonium production. Therefore, even though the patient is acidotic, we said that distal RTA is a form of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Even though the patient is acidotic, urine pH is always over 5.5. So if you see a patient with acidosis and a urine pH, say, of 5, meaning they can acidify the urine, they do not have distal RTA because by definition, distal RTA patients cannot acidify the urine, okay? I cannot emphasize that enough. I know I've mentioned that more than once. So the uh, pH uh, that we're just talking about is unreliable if you have a urinary tract infection because uh, an infection with a urea-splitting organism such as Proteus mirabellus can change the uh, pH, so, so you cannot make that diagnosis. Uh, 
So those patients cannot acidify the urine. They have hypercalciuria and many times stones. They have hypocitraturia. So measuring urine citrate is a very useful indirect way um, to make the diagnosis. Nephrocalcinosis, nephrolithiasis. Usually these stones are calcium phosphate stones. The most common type of stones is calcium oxalate. When you have calcium phosphate stones, think of two things, either distal RTA or second or, or primary hyperparathyroidism. Keep that in mind. So all these features uh, really distinguish distal from proximal RTA. In proximal RTA, the patient can acidify the urine. There's no problem with ammonium. The problem is with uh, not absorbing bicarbonate. You do not have hypercalciuria. You do not have low urine citrate. You do not have nephrocalcinosis or nephrolithiasis. Okay, so how do we make the diagnosis? First, you need to establish a diagnosis of non-anion gap metabolic acidosis. Then, this acidosis is due to impaired distal excretion of hydrogen. So you have, by definition, low ammonium. If you can measure ammonium, I know it's not easy, it would be low. Therefore, urine anion gap is positive. We said in proximal RT, it is what? Negative. Here, it is positive. Now, serum bicarbonate usually is lower than what it is in proximal. It can be as low as 10 to 20. In proximal, we said, well, maybe it's around 16 to, uh, uh, to 20. Here, it can be lower. In both cases, proximal and distal, you have hypokalemia. Renal function is usually normal. Urine pH is high, is over 5.5, even if the patient is acidotic, even if you challenge them, if you... Uh, give them an acid load. If you do the furosemide test, doesn't matter. They cannot acidify the urine. The urine pH will remain above 5.5. An indirect and useful way to making the diagnosis will be low urine citrate. So if you have everything else, you have a positive urine anion gap um, and low urine citrate, uh, it's very helpful. Fraction excretion of bicarbonate, if you can measure it, is 2 to 5%. So again, bicarbonate is not the problem. It is the problem in proximal. If you can measure the urine PCO2 minus blood, blood PACO2, then it's going to be low. Except for amphotericin, it can be normal. The normal value is above 20 to 30%, and we said it is normal with proximal, while it is low with distal. Additional very important features are nephrocalcinosis, nephrolithiasis in children. Also, you can see polyuria and polydipsia. So in children, you have growth retardation. In children and adults, you can have metabolic bone disease, muscle weakness. Impaired urine acidification comes with the territory. And like we said, nephrocalcinosis and nephrolithiasis. Some patients have both proximal and distal RTA. And since proximal is type 2 and distal is type 1, we call it type 3. This is due to carbonic anhydrase 2 deficiency, and patients have osteopetrosis, which is a bone condition, and this is a very, very rare disorder. What about incomplete distal RTA? Everything I've said so far is complete distal RTA. What is incomplete? Incomplete, you look at these patients and their pH is normal, but they have features of distal RTA. They have recurrent calcium phosphate stones, they have low citrate, they have nephrocalcinosis, so you need a confirmatory test. What's that confirmatory test? You, so you challenge them. You give them an acid dose. You give them ammonium chloride. And ammonium chloride induces metabolic acidosis. You check serial pHs. And um, once you have that, you measure the urine uh, pH. And patients with incomplete distal RTA, at that point, they cannot lower their pH below 5.5 or 5.3. Uh, since uh, ammonium chloride has many GI side effects, uh, many clinicians would give furosemide 40 milligrams and fludrocortisone 1 milligram orally, which is a big dose of fludrocortisone, to stimulate distal hydrogen secretion, and then you uh, measure the pH. Um, so this is how you make a diagnosis of incomplete distal RTA. At any rate, you still have to give them potassium citrate, replace the potassium, and replace the citrate because uh, the problem is their uh, calcium phosphate stones. This is a, a picture of a patient with nephrocalcinosis. Uh, 
um, you can see how severe the calcification is. Obviously, there's no contrast involved. This is how the, the kidneys uh, look. Treatment, uh, it, it, very important, especially in children, because you have to give alkali to normalize growth. Like we said uh, with proximal, uh, you have to normalize uh, their uh, bicarbonate. And uh, this treatment improves hypercalciuria, improves hypocitraturia, decreased kidney stone formation. Here the dose is much less than with proximal. Only one to two mil equivalent per kilo per day is enough. And uh, you have to replace both potassium and alkali. You have to start with potassium and then you give the alkali. Otherwise, you'll end up with the hypokalemia. Uh, and I uh, mentioned these uh, options uh, when uh, we talked about proximal uh, RTA, uh, what uh, uh, tablets and solutions are available. So I will not uh, dwell on that again. Now, I will end here. In the next lecture, we'll talk about hyperkalemic RTA. Thank you very much.